Hi, it's Mike again with Uptastic. I'm still here at GoToConf Chicago. They haven't kicked me out yet. I'm sitting down with Dan North. Uh, Dan is uh, well known as the kind of the father of BDD. Well, not the you are the one who wrote the first uh, paper and description and first mm -hmm. implementations. Um, and I also think it's fascinating that you're kind of an iconocla iconoclast who likes to question dogma. Over the yes. years, yes, the, I over do. the last seven years, BDD has become dogma. <laughs> Either you do it or you don't. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, you can't do BDD. You, TDD, you got to do BDD. And, and there's all these things. And being that you're a person who questions dogma, what is it like to be somebody who created something who's now been accepted as a dogmatic thing? As, as a dogma. I think, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this to me comes down to experience. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you have someone who is uh, new to something, mm -hmm when they're a novice in a particular area, they want to just find a thing that works. Mm -hmm. They want to be told what to do, they want rules, they want structure, and they want to be able to just follow a recipe, and, and they want to get quick wins in that right. way. This is sort of part of learning theory, is that this is how, how we operate while we gain context mm -hmm. and while we gain experience. And once we've got a bunch of experience and a bunch of context, we can start making good decisions. Right. Now, what happens is people will pick up something um, without any context and say, right, well then this, this must be how it works. Mm -hmm. And they're really uncomfortable, uh, as, as I was talking about, with uncertainty. Right. They don't like the idea of uncertainty. They don't like the idea that we can't know some things. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they'll fill in the blanks. And, and this is what we do. So BDD, um, I've, I've deliberately never written down, I mean, I, I wrote the Introducing BDD right. article, but I've never really been that descriptive or prescriptive about what it is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. Um, because to me it isn't a set of practices, it's a, a way of engaging, right? It's a, it's, a way of, it's a way of trying to get work done. Yeah, it's a way of thinking about a problem. Yeah, and, and uh, Liz Keogh says this really well, she's basically, it's, it's about the conversations, right? Okay. It's, everything comes back to the conversations. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I said in a talk recently, like the only BDD tool mm -hmm. that matters is the one in your head. But that's it, everything else is, is, is just detail. And so you get the kind of the camps that are the you know the the RSpec camps right. and the, the J Behave camps and the Cucumber camps and all these guys and then and then uh, this world of, of misinformation about oh BDD is this and BDD is that and you know BDD only works at this high level and, and then you use TDD down in the, in the whatever um, and I think a lot of that is a is a basic misunderstanding of what TDD is mm -hmm. um, and what I was trying to do with BDD and where that's ended up so. I think with anything, as long as soon as it's around um, for any length of time, people will become dogmatic about it. Right. There, there's there, there's a there's a subset of people. There's a, you know there, there, there's a there's a type of people, if you like, who are going to pick up on something, mm -hmm. and especially when they start making that their thing. Like if right. they're selling, you know, I'm a BDD consultant, right. then they've got to sound pretty definite about things. This is this is BDD and this isn't BDD. This is why you should listen to me. Yeah, this is why you should listen to me. This is why you should pay me bucks. Right. You know. Um, so, I, I have a working theory. It's only a theory. I have no data. Only it's uh, only 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 observational, uh, which is that people start selling certifications in things when they well, like yeah, like any of those things when when they think it's the last good idea they're going to have. Mm. So there's a um, yeah. I, I'm going to I'm going to monetize this thing. Now, I, I never wanted to monetize BDD um, because I don't think it's a, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's a useful thing. It's yeah. a useful thing. You shouldn't monetize ideas. I think that's, I think that's, that's crazy. Or, or, or rather, you shouldn't try and lock down ideas. There's a, I came across a lovely quote, um, if you want an idea to, to, to travel, you shouldn't try and travel with it. Oh, okay. And well, I really I, like that. Yeah. I re, I, you know, and, you, and you look at... Well, don't, don't assign it to your personality. No, no, very much so. Here you go. So put it out there. So um, BDD started as me trying to coach TDD better because TDD is so awesome. I love TDD. I love the, the thinking that goes in TDD. And I, you know, you, you've heard me bashing on TDD. Right. I'm not. I'm bashing on TDD zealots um, because I'm bashing on zealots. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what TDD. I mean? It's, like, it's, it's not TDD. TDD is a pattern. Right. Okay. It's a pattern in the classic uh, Alexandrian sense of a pattern. It's a strategy that works well in a particular situation, in a certain context, it resolves some forces, it introduces other forces, 
and it needs to be used in conjunction with a bunch of other patterns. So there are places where the, the, the it's the first thing I reach for is TDD. Right. There are other places where it's just going to slow me down, or it's going to be irrelevant, or it's even going to lead me to a wrong solution. Mm -hmm. You know. So so when people say, "Oh, Dan North is anti TDD," that's that's it almost sounds like that dogma trying to find a conflict where it, it really isn't. It's yeah, yeah it's, 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 make, it's making up a phantom enemy, and, and it, it, that's part of it. But I think part of it as well is it makes a good sound bite. Yeah. You know, uh, Dan North is advocating copying and pasting code. I, I, I am, right? Yeah. There's, there's a certain context in which I want to copy and paste code, mm -hmm. uh, um, and the context is very specific, and I describe it. It's one of my um, accelerated agile patterns called Ginger Cake, and the point about it is it's a pattern it works in a certain context that doesn't say you should always copy and paste code or you should never copy and paste code it says given these constraints in this environment in this context it's a useful strategy to have in your pocket yeah yeah and it, that it's that when it's towards that level of mastery where i wonder if part of the dogma is people just don't feel uh, confident enough also that there's well, actually, I'm going to take a step back, and I want okay. to just go back to what you were talking about with the last idea. I've heard uh, that the reason that they want to charge money for it is because they think it's going to be the last idea. They, mm -hmm. but I've heard that in uh, with music as well. I've heard that as an argument why is that um, right? That's how many songs does an artist have in them, and if they don't charge for them, how do they know that they're going to have another hit? And if they don't protect their copyright, how do they know they're going to? You know, ah, so, so right, so 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 it's, it, it's them thinking I've I've got a hit here, so yeah. I need to yeah, okay, I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So that was. It, it sounds like it's a human way of thinking about problems. Mm -hmm. It isn't unique to software development. It is. It's just humans do this when you're when we're confronted with the fear of, this is all I've got. Yeah, yeah, maybe a sense. Yeah, uh, uh, um, Linda Rice was talking about this yesterday. Loss aversion. Okay. So the so the idea that you have a thing and you might lose the thing is much more compelling than. Uh, so she was talking about reward structures, and she said if you offer someone a bonus for doing something, mm -hmm. it actually it, it ends up being a disincentive. Like all the data says, it ends up being a disincentive. Is that the Dan Pink's drive? I think it's. Um, they, oh, there's a ton of there's a yeah. ton of research around this. Okay. Um, he's one of them certainly, and that whole sort of behavioral economics school. Mm -hmm. um, but that if you uh, pr present it as I've already given you this bonus, mm -hmm. but you'll lose it if you don't reach these targets. People will work extra hard to hit those targets. Okay, so it's not even that though it's, it's hypothetical. It's it's here's your carrot, Bob. I'm gonna take it away. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's, it's the risk of losing a carrot yeah. Yeah. is more effective than a carrot yeah. or a stick. Yeah, is to offer the carrot as a thing that you could lose. And I can see how that is because I can be like, I have this carrot. Mm -hmm. They're gonna take it away. Versus, I don't have a carrot. I don't lose anything. But yeah. you know, I, I I might work all the way up to the line and not get it. Uh, you know, I, I have to say even. What you describe is, it, I've seen these bonuses at companies where now when a company says, oh, we're going to offer a bonus to you uh, for performance. I've been in enough companies where all of a sudden at bonus time, it was, you know, we weren't doing so hot last year. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it's been a tough year. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have to yeah. pull that, that belt yeah. a little bit tighter. <laughs> just, yeah. just see my new boat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and people will leave. I mean, you'll right. actually lose people by, by doing that because of the, the loss. Of that. They've now lost that thing and they're like, great. Yeah, I, I, I nearly had that thing and I lost it. Right. Um, so it reminds me of a, there's a great interview with um, Alanis Morissette, okay. randomly uh, in one of the music magazines, and, uh, and it's about her second album. So her first album's an angry, right. angry music, yeah. And then her second album, she's met this guy and she's really in love <laughs> and she's really happy, and it's this album of happy songs. Things have gotten much better. Things have gotten much better, and it's, it's it's actually it's a good album. There's some solid songs on there, but it's a happy album. And and they were saying like all your fans are, are really furious because yeah. you, you know you're you're not writing this angry music. And she's right. like, I don't write angry music. I write music about how I'm feeling. Yeah. I was angry, so I wrote angry music. I'm happy as so I'm writing happy music. Yeah. I like to it's cut myself to the first album. But yeah, yeah, the German, one, yeah. It just doesn't yeah. work. Well, and this is the, and yeah, exactly. And it's like you know, I, I, I'm a fan of yours, and I want to, I want, I want you to carry on being angry because that's right. what I associate with you. And and you get, um, you know, in our industry, I think there's there's something of that as well. There's a there's a cult of personality thing, where you associate someone with something, and and that can become a reinforcing loop. Yeah. So there's folks, um, certainly in the kind of agile end of the industry. Who, who do do one thing and they do the one thing again and again and again and again and it's like well you know are you stuck there like mm -hmm. move, move that thing forward that thing was great it was a great solution for the problem you had in that context what's the new context what, right. what how does that move forward um, 
someone who's the antithesis of that uh, is someone like Michael Feathers, mm -hmm. who's always, always on something new. Right. He's always like, he's always, brain's always going, he's always coming up with ideas. You know, he wrote this book about legacy code right. you know, about 100 years ago, which is like, still a classic and still deserves a place on every programmer's bookshelf. And he's just doing crazy, crazy other stuff now. Right. And he's looking at uh, how code bases evolve over time and, and all this. And he's, you know, every time I see him speak, it's fascinating, it's new, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it, it's taking ideas forwards. And so uh, the, 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 there are folks who, you know, the, the, the only association I have with Michael is it's going to be interesting. Right. 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 Do you know what I mean? It's not, I don't know what he's going to talk about, but it's yeah. going to be interesting. And it's the, um, I, I call it the, the, the noun problem. Once you get a noun as your middle name that says, like, like you know, you're, you're the, the legacy code guy or you're the BDD guy, then you're kind of like, well, yeah, I'm doing other stuff as well. BDD yeah. was one step on that journey. And, and also, um, if you look at it as a little ecosystem, there's, I'm not, I'm not where the action is. Right. Right? If you look at Goiko Adjic with specification by example, you look at Liz Keo with the BDD for life stuff, um, you look at Chris Matz and Olaf Marston with the real options, and like all of these things are kind of going off in really interesting, crazy directions. Yeah. And I'm looking at that going, wow. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying seeing that. From the other, other side of it, as somebody who's like, I remember reading uh, your, your post about uh, BDD back you know, in, in 06 or 07, and I was doing .NET at the time, and I remember just you know, being like, oh, this is, you know, this is really great, and wanting to figure out how to do this in .NET because it hadn't been defined yet, but I can understand that urge to want to look at the first person, you know, the first mm -hmm. person who, who initiated it, and maybe not necessarily trusting those that came after. And when yes. you're looking and you're trying to figure out what this thing is and you're trying to understand <clears> and get something in your mind, that I can remember continually going back to your blog and trying to get more information out of, because you, yeah, I need to write more. I need to write more. It goes to the blog. cult of personality thing. Yeah. Um, where instead of me just thinking about the idea and saying, how do we talk about this idea? Mm -hmm. It was more of, well, how do I understand more about what that person was trying to say? And then yeah, it becomes, yeah, yeah. well, so I, I could see how that, that thought process can evolve in people who are looking at these ideas. Well, and this is, this is why I, I name drop as furiously as yeah. I do is what I want is that when people come searching for, you know, for me because of BDD, mm -hmm. the, you know, pretty, the first or second thing they see will be me talking about Liz or talking about Goiko right. or talking about Chris or you know, these guys. Because then they go, ah, well that's somewhere else I can look. And, and it creates that association. Eric Evans does the same thing with Domain Driven Design. He'll talk about um, you know, the, the folks who, who have taken that on mm -hmm. and, and, and evolved that and developed that. So you, you go and look at pretty much any of his talks and he's talking about what other people are doing with, with his ideas, which is fantastic. Yeah, it, it sounds like... Uh, it kind of creates a generational thing, you know, it's like yeah. a, you, you, know you, see, you see these things evolve. And it's a different mindset between that I have to push people down to lift myself up versus I'm going to build people up and as I build them up, I'll come up with that. Well, it's the zero-sum game thing. It's like I, I, I don't believe in kind of slicing up a pie. I believe in trying to make a bigger pie. Do you know right, what I mean? Right, right. Because then that's that, that, that everyone and, wins. Then everybody eats yeah. and, and we all have a lot of pie. Yeah, we all have a lot of pie, which yeah. is awesome because pie's good. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, uh, going to so many different conferences and speaking to um, different types of audiences, one of the things I've talked to some speakers about is how do they prepare and how do they maybe change their messages or how do you or do you change your message when you're talking to a predominantly Java audience or predominantly uh, agile practitioners, people who identify themselves as agile people and they, mm -hmm. they come. Do you, when you are going to be talking about your topics, do you adjust um, what you're going to say for the audience, or do you say, I have a message, and it, I'm going to just keep repeating that specific message? So, um, now who was it? I think it was someone like Rebecca Parsons, who's the uh, CTO at ThoughtWorks, said to me, when I was talking about BDD, and I said to her, I, I feel like I've been talking about BDD forever. And right. she said, if you've got an idea and it's a good idea, you'll just find that you keep saying it again and again mm -hmm. and again and again because people need to hear it again and right. again and again right. and you're going to go to lots of different audiences and, and you're going to keep saying that message. Now, um, that's if you're trying to get a particular idea across. What I find is, and I, I was looking back, I've got like, uh, I don't know, 40 or 50 different talks I've given over right. about you know, eight years or something across all kinds of different topics. and. What I'll try and do, even if I'm giving the same talk again on the same, you know, 
title and, and abstract kind right. of thing. So it's the same. It's the rough. It's largely the same message. I'll always try and refresh it, okay. and because it may be that you know, if it's a talk I gave six months ago, mm -hmm. my thinking's moved on, and I look at it and I go, do I still think those things, or have I? Uh, tuned that message or actually this thing came out a bit ambiguous and so I want to kind of tweak it so I'm constantly tweaking my talks uh, constantly tweaking well yeah so tr trying to move the ideas forward I mean I um, I had a massive uh, I think epiphany is probably the right word um, in the last couple of years with the accelerated agile stuff mm -hmm. I, I went from being a um, you know, big A agile consultant in a big A agile consulting firm I mean you know, ThoughtWorks isn't doesn't have a, a named methodology, if you like. Um, you know, they'll use whatever uh, works in a situation. They're very pragmatic in that way. But there was very much a ThoughtWorks feel of doing Agile. Right. And the kind of clients I'd be working with is big, heavy, enterprise organizations where you needed to move at, you know, help them move at the speed right. they could move at. And then I ended up in this tiny little team doing crazy stuff and, and had to rethink a whole bunch of stuff. So I was, you know, I was, you know, you say the iconoclast thing. I there were a whole bunch of like for me real core truths that, right. I, that I that I I've, I I sincerely believed about how software gets written that I've found myself challenging. And what what I try and do in those situations, you, know, you can either just go la la la, I'm gonna go back in my you know, right. in my happy place, um, or or try and assimilate that. And so that's where I've ended up now. And someone was asking me about like, you know, why, why have I called it Accelerated Agile and not be past Agile and isn't, well, isn't there time for a new thing? And the, I think the main discovery I've, I've made or the main realization I've come to over the last couple of years is the thing I've been working with and the thing I've been, you know, that I'm now trying to document is Agile. Right. As in the manifesto rather than Agile as in the methodology. Right. You know, the methodology so is... Getting back to the core principles. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, and people over process suggests that people and interactions are more important than any process. Ergo, as soon as you start defining that as a process, you've systemically set up to fail, right? You know, there is a dogma around Scrum, there is a dogma around Kanban, there is a dogma around BDD, there is a dogma around all these different things. XP, uh, XP had the Twelve Commandments. You know, right. now, yeah, you talk to Ken Beck about XP. And that's the opposite of anything he wanted people to be thinking. Really? Right? He's very much, he's entirely values driven. Mm -hmm. you know, he's very much, uh, like the, the, the whole point for him, the whole point of the first book was you know, communicate, um, communication, simplicity, feedback, or you know, the, the, the core values. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, here's some things we did on this really cool project. Yeah. So here's some nice tools a, that support yeah, that. Yeah, here's some nice tools that support that. And it, and it was experiential. It was like, we've done this, and these are the things that we found that worked. Now, you have to do this. Right. And, and then that became, you know, and, and he also had this lovely picture of how they support each other and which yeah. ones, it was a pattern diagram. It was right. a, 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 a diagram of, result, of resolving forces and patterns. Like he thinks in patterns, he's one of those guys. And unfortunately people wanted rules. And the point about a pattern is it's contextual. And the point about rules is they're not. And so people took all these patterns, all these really good it's ideas really like nice. TDD, like pair programming is brilliant in many situations. It's not a thing you should, you know, it's not, a, it's not there, are, there are no silver bullets, right, including that. Uh, automation. Automation has a, you know, an evil dark side. Right? Right. As soon as you automate something, you're locking that thing. You, you're now making that thing brittle. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, which may be okay. Maybe you want fast and repeatable at the expense of uh, malleable. Mm -hmm. But it is at the expense of. Right, right. Yeah? There's, there's always trade-offs. Yeah, and, and all of these things. And so, um, so... Dogma, I mean, coming, bringing right back to, to your, 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 your opening question, um, I think dogma comes from where we don't have context or where we have fear. Mm -hmm. and I think those two things tend to be very closely related. So the more context we have, the more experience we have, the more we understand a situation, the less fearful we are, or the less irrationally fearful we are. Right? So it's, it's, it, it all comes down to Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> it always comes yeah. down to Yoda. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, that's good.